Welcome to Glass in Session. I'm your host, Val. Thank you for joining me. If you are a returning listener, thank you for clicking play yet again. If you're new to this, what I'm now calling a wine podacy or strange booze trip depends on the day. I'm so glad you're here. Now, even though this is part two of our Roan White series, I've linked up part one in the show notes if you want to go back and learn about Quite simply, the three white grapes that rock some of the more popular white wine appellations between Vienne and Valence. You'll also find some ancient history that I will not drone on about today. Suffice to say, you can check off Greeks, Romans, and monks off your wine history bingo card. You can see what that looks like in my tea public store, which I linked up at the bottom of the show notes also. But first, where are we? To get our bearings, the Rhone Valley, the second largest region in terms of production in France behind Bordeaux. With the Rhone Valley divided into two what I call distinct chunks, the northern and southern Rhone, we have the northern Rhone, which is differentiated from the southern Rhone, not just by geography, but by climate, soils, wine styles, production, terroir, tradition, all those things. Now, here in the southern Rhone is where we find 95% of the Rhone Valley production. Not a lot of that is white. Only about 10% of the entire north-south production of all the Rhone is white. But for the purposes of this discussion, I am not talking about Côte du Rhone or Côte du Rhone village. I should have pointed that out in the last episode. I'm really only talking named village appellations or what they call the crew AOCs, Appellation d'Origine Contrôlée. And it is the whites we will discuss as we head south of Montélimar toward Avignon on our cork dark delicious Rhone white road trip. The first crew we come across, Von Sober and Rasto. Oh, wait. Both of these are known for their 100% red production. Rasto in particular, known for their sweet vendu naturel. These are sweet, delicious dessert wines. But alas, we must seek to quench our thirst for white wines further south still. Thus, we stop briefly in the single village appellation of Caron, a crew only since 2016, days after I sat the diploma exam, so I didn't have to try to stuff one more French wine nugget into my noggin before emptying it onto 14 handwritten, painfully scrawled pages. Before that, it was one of them there 18 villages that can be on the Côte de Rhone village labels with stricter production standards than Côte de Rhone labeled wines. Again, a discussion for a whole other day. So Caron, surely it's mostly red, but 5 to 6% of that production is white. And sure, the appellation is small, about a thousand hectares, but we have quite the selection of grapes to pick from for what have been described as luscious whites from this windswept region of the Rhone Valley. Primary or principal grapes are the Grenache Blanc, at least 20%, Claret, at least 30%, and Rouzon, at least 20%. We learned about that one last time. Accessories to the white wine blend include the other two we discussed last time, Viognier and Marzan, as well as Bourbon and Picpoul Blanc. These can only make up 20% or less of the blend. So what does that mean, these grapes, Val? What does this mean in the glass? This means that this white wine, which is only 6% of production, and why do I care about the Caron Blanc if I can even get my mitts on it? Well, I thought about it as I choose the fringier topics for this podcast because I don't want to be like other wine podcasts. I thought about the Grenache Noir in red wines and what that brings to the table. So as with that fuller bodied type grape, Grenache Blanc in white wines brings what I call the house, the foundation of the structure, as well as a little spice. The claret, that's going to bring in a pretty white floral note and reinforce a little bit of that backbone. And then we look to that Roussan for the citrus fruit lift and maybe a little herbal freshness. Fun, right? Put some in the trunk and let's drive on for Giganos awaits us. Gigon what? Gigalo? No, 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 no. My goodness, this place. I'm going to have to post a picture of the village or the village of Gigondas with the Dentel de Montmorail in the distance. I was leaning out the window at Pierre Amadou's tasting room, snapped this photo, and it is just the most beautiful scene. A little more on the Dentels as these limestone gray badass mountains are part of that geological upheaval I talked about in the last episode that formed so much of this part of France. This was once the Mediterranean Sea, different from the granitic bedrock of the Northern Rhone, the Southern Rhone Jurassic and Cretaceous limestone, very similar to what we talked about in Champagne, along with some of that Cenozoic sandstone created this beautiful landscape. And incidentally, it was the same event that formed the Alps and the Pyrenees. Just shove those babies right up toward the sky and ta-da! I linked up a fabulous page from Gigandos Van website with photos and an instructive animation on how these stunning formations came to be. This was one of my favorite tour stops. I mentioned I was on a wine tour in October with Fine Vintage. Shout out, not an ad, just love, love, love them. 
And this is where I learned so much good juju that I shall now impart into your ear holes because I have the picture of these dentels up right now for inspiration. Zhigondas, absolutely banging reds. Cannot say enough about the red because that's 99% of production. But rosé is only 1%. Wait, 99 plus 1 equals 100. So do we not thirst for Vent Blanc? And pourquoi pour l'on de Gigondas? We speak of Gigondas because I'm stupidly excited to tell you that as of 2022, Gigondas can now start producing Gigondas Blanc, which was made before a small bit of it, but it was normally labeled like Cote de Rhone. So what does this mean? This means after 11 years of Gigondas producers working toward this goal, now with at least 70% of Claret Blanc, whom we've already met several times now, and a cast of complimentary grapes such as Barbolin, Claret Rose, Grenache Blanc, Gris, and Marzan, Rouzon, Pique Pool Blanc, and up to 5% of these secondary grapes, Viognier and Uni Blanc, we can now craft a worthy, structurally sound, can I say that? Structurally sound, just did, plush and round, structurally sound, thank you, 2800 hours of sunshiny year with white and stone fruit, citrus, white flowers, balanced acidity, and quite the characterful finish. I've also linked up a great article from this from Wine, Wit, and Wisdom, and this is the official blog of the Society of Wine Educators. You know I'm a member. You know I'm a fan. I love the way Miss Jane keeps us posted on all the latest wine news. That's the best place to get it. I've also linked up the current Cahiers de Charge as of this recording that shows all the changes to this crew, this appellation highlight in yellow for your convenience. Now it is in French, but you know how to use translate apps. So I'm not sure how much of the production of this new Blanc category is going to be in Gigondas' future, but don't you want to be the first among your friends to say, hey, got some Gigondas Blanc. What do you mean? What is Gigondas Blanc? Pull up some rock. Let's try it. Let's look at videos of the Earth's crust pushing these dentels in Montmorai up through the sea. Now that I've gotten all hopped up on something new and only coming into existence, let's drive southwest to Vaquera. Also in the foothills of the Dentel de Montmorail, there are so many vineyards on steep slopes and glacial terraces. Again, such dramatic landscape. While it's also hot here, that famous Mistra wind that affects so much of this part of France does its part to fight mildew and keep the grapes cool and fresh. White wines here are only 6% of production or less, but you know, I found a bottle. I found it at Leon Avignon and I have it right here. It's not open yet because, oh, medications, can't be drinking, but... It's been a crew since 1990, and it's been around since the Romans, this whole winemaking in this area. Again, with the Romans, we know this, but viticultural evidence really started showing up prominently around the Middle Ages. Again, as with many of the villages discussed in this episode and the episode before this, also in common with other villages, this appellation started as a Cote de Rhone region. Then it became a named village for the Cote de Rhone village appellation in the 1960s. And then Vakira earned its crew status in 1990. So why do we want to seek out these whites? Again, it's one of those off the beaten path finds that make the cork dorkiest of cork dork super happy. And what to expect in a glass? Well, it's a blend of Bourbolin, Grenache Blanc, Marzan, Roussan, Viognier. And I should note that these can show up in the rosé and reds as accessory grapes as well. So that's fun, at least up to 5%. What's even more fun is any of these white grapes must make up no more than 80% of the blend. Honestly, I won't try to characterize these as it's a crapshoot, right? But if you find yourself with a bottle, you can go to the AOC Vacura website and poke around on the white sapage or the grapes, and they'll give you the lowdown on what to expect in the glass. So if you have a wine that, let's say, is mostly Bourbolin, you click on that grape and it, it gives you all the good juju and the grape geekery and the cork dorkiness that we love. And when I open mine, I'll be happy to post some tasting notes. But right now, I'm drinking bubbly water. Yay me. Next. This brings us to the Chateau Neuf de Pop. I'm sure a lot of you have been waiting for this. It also brings us to a little bit of history because of course it does, because there are popes. There are popes. Well, apparently the popes dug this beautifully rugged part of France because in the 14th century, they loaded up their pope trucks and moved to France. The Vaucluse department, that is, about halfway between Orange and Avignon, seven popes hung out there, delighted in the wines, planted more vines, 
Pope number two of the seven, John the, it looks like 22nd XXII, yep, 22nd, he built the summer residence at Chateauneuf du Pop, or the new castle of the Pope, which is what that translates to. Pope number three was Benedict the XII, that would be the 12th. He had to one up the second Pope. He goes, oh yeah, you got a summer residence at Chateauneuf du Pop, which is the name of the village. Well, guess what? I built a freaking palace it's called the Palais du Pop in Avignon, because what's a Pope without a palace? Back in one of the Rhone Outliers episode, I did on Tavel very early on in this now five-year podacy. I talked about how the fifth Avignon Pope, Pope Innocente VI or Innocent VI, was fond of the stuff from the other side of the river, from the right bank of the Rome, so much so that he had the Priore de Montezargue, which is now an excellent Tavel producer, delivered to his home. Even once the popes packed up their papacy and hightailed it back home to Rome, to the Rome mothership, Tavel wines were still exported to Italy. I like to call this one of the first wine clubs. In the 17th century, some of the first quality regulations were written for the wines for the administrative district, and following centuries, so we're in the 1800s now, the district expanded to include the left bank vines as well as the vaunted right bank, and the region became officially the Côte de Rhone. So that's actually how it became part of the whole bigger Côte de Rhone picture. But we're going to stop here because we're trying to focus on the white wines of the Rhone Valley, so let's wrap those for a hot second. The whites of Chateauneuf du Pape, only about 5% of production, depending on, again, who you're talking to. Some say four, some say six. I mean the middle, let's say five. Honestly, I adore the reds of Chateauneuf du Pape. That was one of my motivations of taking this tour. My husband loves them as much as I do. And between the history, the terroir, the famous round rocks, I know you've seen pictures of these pudding stones, or the French call them galets, some which can be as big as basketballs. The winemaking itself, because count them, 13, 13 grapes, red, white, gray, pink varieties, all allowed to be in the Chateauneuf de Pop finished wine. I truly believe Chateauneuf de Pop can only be done justice in a single episode. But for now, we're babbling blanc. So let's gap on the grapes for the Chateauneuf de Pop blanc that we absolutely fell in love with at Chateau Le Nair. Not an ad, just an experience I'm sharing with you. We brought home the 22, which is a blend of our classic Rhone buddies that we've met earlier. In this case, 49% Grenache Blanc, the house, 33% Rouzon, the fruit, 12% Claret, hey flowers, and 6% Barbolan. Chateauneuf de Pas Blanc can be made with any of the grapes that can be used for the red, according to paragraph 5 of the Cahier de Charge, which I linked up for you. Would you like me to list them all in alphabetical order? Nope, I won't, because there's a fun fact I gotta point out to you here. Everybody says 13 grapes. Even if you watch the, was it the Amazon or the Apple series, uh, Good to Do, or if you knew the famous comic book about the wine contest, it, one of the trivia questions, I believe, was how many grapes are allowed in Chapter New to Pop? 13. 13 is a standard answer on exams as well. But if you count the pink, gray, white, black, rose, gris, blanc, et noir mutations of claret, grenache, and pique pool, you get to 18. It even says so in the Cahier de Charge, and there is no Marzan allowed in the Chateau Neuf de Pop, a notable exception from the other Blancs we've covered here in the Southern Rhone. Isn't that fascinating? So any of those 18 grapes, you can put them in the white, you can put them in the red, it's all fine. But what to expect in the glass? Oh, again, we speak of winemaker options because richness, creaminess stands out to me from the few I've gotten to taste. Tree fruits like peach, pear, ripe citrus, reminds me of Meyer lemon, tropical fruits and other families of aromas and flavors that come from the winemaking, such as vanilla from the wood, spice, elegance, layers, complexity, as well as a long meditation-worthy finish. That's what I had in my notes. Nope, wasn't drunk because I'm a spitter. Except at lunch, I do not spit at the dining table, and we had the lovely Blanc with a lobster pumpkin raviolo with some kind of candied lemon thing on top. It was, it was incredible. Need I say more about the food compatibility of this wine and something that I think will impress your friends should you serve it at a turkey dinner sometime. Just a thought. But it is time to split this noble pebble-strewn terrain. Across the river we go. 10 miles northeast of Avignon, we head to Lirac. 11% of production here is white. Fewer than 800 hectares of vines, but it's been a Cote de Rhone cruise since October of 1947. The whites here in Lirac, well, we've already met the principal grapes, Berbalin Claret, Grenache Blanc, Rouzon up to 60%, and the accessory grapes, Marzon, Picpou Blanc, Uni Blanc, Viognier, up to 25% for any single one of these, up to 30% if you're blending those together and shoving them in the total blend. Did you notice that Marzon was invited back to the party? They're no longer a GNG, a grape non grata, as they were in Chateauneuf de Pop. The wines from this area are lovely medium-bodied styles. Why? Warmer temperature, riper grapes. These, a lot of these are late ripening grapes. And apparently there's a little 
fermentation very common here in the barrel. So you're going to get the stone fruits I've often mentioned on the nose and palate. You're going to get a little spice, you're going to get a little fennel as I often mentioned, especially in one wine from a producer that I have. I have the Chateau Montfaucon, Comtesse Madeleine with aforementioned Marzon Claret, uh, Grenache Blanc, Pic Poul. I haven't opened it yet may have to do so as soon as I can start drinking again. And to round out our Rhone junket, I will just mention, we aren't talking Lorac's neighbor, Tavel. I know you're probably looking at a map right now, as I know some of you do, of the Rhone going, hey Val, what about Tavel? No, it's rosé all day, all the time here, 100%. That's all they do is rosé. I linked up a few fun extras for you. I did an episode of Wine for Bet Street podcast where we talk about Tavel with Debbie and Lori, and they had the Chateau de Carria, which I actually got to go visit, and I tasted their Lurac Blanc, oddly enough, and their Tavel, which I'd had before. But I believe that was my first Lurac Blanc was at Chateau de Carria. And I got a few other end notes for you before I close out this episode. There are some Rhone outliers. If you're looking at a map of the Rhone, you're going, oh yeah, DUI, I remember that one. I linked that one up. I've done an episode on that. Done my own episode on Tavel as well. But I didn't talk about Grignan Les Adimar today, which changed its name from Coteau de Turkestan after <clears throat> a nuclear incident. No shade being thrown at the wines, which should very well get some coverage in the future also. Ventoux, Luberon, Cote de Vivre, uh, Claret de Bellegarde. There's another one I can think of along with its neighbor, Costier de Nimes, which is very interesting because I can explain to you in a future episode why the bottles bear an embossed crocodile. Yes, it does. Does it have to do with Romans? Of course, that remains to be seen in the wacky and wonderful world of future Rhone Outliers episodes. Why are they outliers? They lie outside the actual Cote de Rhone zone, so I just call them outliers, but they are worthy of recognition and they are worthy of discussion on this podcast. So in summary, crocodiles and nuclear mishaps might be the best place to leave off this week. And in conclusion, I hope you enjoyed this weird Rhone road trip through the whites that I took you on these past two episodes. Altogether, we traveled over 155 miles or so to see what's what with the Rhone white wines. Did you notice that we started with a single grape varietal wine in Condrieu, the Viognier, yay me, Condrieu, yay you, that's how I remember it. And then as we worked our way south, we picked up, oh, there's another grape, Marsan, Roussan. And then as we get into the southern room, we start picking up more grapes along the way until there are like 13 of them allowed to be shoved into a Chateau Neuf de Pop Blanc. I think that's great. I think it's fascinating. And if you made it this far again, yay you. You are thirsty for knowledge, in which case I have another treat for you. I'm going to leave you with about five minutes of audio in which one of my favorite wine writers and personalities, Andrew Jefford of Decanter Magazine, talks with one of France's best sommeliers, Christophe Tassin. He, 20 years ago, earned France's highest honor for sommeliers, the Meilleur Vieux de France, or MOF. You might have seen them outside a chocolate shop or a cookie shop if you're walking around Paris. Well, he was that, but for wine. He's from Avignon originally. He's a Rhone ambassador. And I linked up the whole episode if you want to drink it in from the beginning, along with a slew of other sites from the Appalachians, the Cahier de Charge, if you want to geek out on production. However, here is five minutes of Christophe and Andrew on some cultural aspects of Rhone whites in particular and their place at the table. Let's uh, ask you to put your sommelier hat on for a moment and just tell us how the Rhone's white wines fit into the, the gastronomic universe. Um, you know, what's the point of them in, in the mealtime context? When, when would you recommend a white wine from the Rhone rather than a white wine from Burgundy or from Pesac Leonion or from uh, California somewhere? What do they do in a meal context? Right, so a white wine in the Rhone is, is, uh, 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 is, is a step you, you, you must uh, try as well to, to understand, I mean, on the consumer side, on the sommelier side, uh, because uh, it, it is what I would call an, an anomaly uh, on the sense of why do... Uh, white varietals were planted in in all the days. Uh, what was the function of of the white varietals? And if you th if you watch the, the the varietals that were planted at that time, like the the Claret, uh, the Bourboulinque, uh, the Pigpool, all of these varietals are late ripening grapes. Uh, so their purpose were to be uh, uh, harvested at the same time than the red, and bring the acidic component that were not available technically 
in in the in the in the forties, in the fifties, uh, uh, or even after Pasteur on the late nineteenth century, there was not acid. I mean, malic acid that you could add just like with the few splashes of, of spoons on, on on your wine making thing. So there were natural. Uh, experience from the, 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 the winemakers to balance their wine and again uh, goes going against the, the, the heat and the mistral and the dryness and, and, and not having wines overpowered by alcohol uh, they had the intelligence to spread when they were planting vineyards uh, these white varietals in the middle of the red and you have uh, randomly planted white in the middle of the red so which when the appellation system was created, which uh, uh, had an obligation to not cut off this tradition uh, to the white of the Rhone. So there is only Cornas, to my knowledge, on the north uh, that cannot add any of the white, but any single, all of the single other appellations still have the authorization of practice to ferment, co-ferment the, the white. You, obviously, you do not, not blend white wine and red wine after, but the, you have to, to co-ferment uh, the white for the red. But now, in the 90s, with the, the technology and uh, the, 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 the stainless steel tanks, the, the control of temperatures in the new cellars, they did not need anymore this acidic balance from the white grape. So they started to treat and to, to harvest the white separately because in the same way on uh, masterizing and, and, and monitoring the cold temperature of the, the fermentation, they were able to get wines that were uh, uh, fresh. And, and uh, the Viognier is the top example. The, almost the grapes almost disappeared from, from Condrieu after World War II. There were only a couple of acres uh, b because they, they wanted it and it was almost always slightly, slightly uh, sweet and residual sugar. But on, so on, on the south, uh, I think since these new technologies were in, implemented in, in, in cellars, you have delightful wines. Uh, uh, delightful whites. The, the Grenache white came out, but again, it's barely by itself. You always have a mix of Clairette, uh, Roussanne, uh, Marsanne, uh, often some Viognier in the south that to bring some fruit. But these are uh, 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 wines that lots of sommeliers uh, love to use because they are uh, 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 on a different, uh, 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 how can I say, the profile compared to the Chardonnay and, and, and the complexity and the oak aging. Uh, it's different than Bordeaux because the Sauvignon and Semillon blend is a little more citrusy and a little more uh, 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 acidic. So you have now another category of white that is food friendly. On the sense of it's, yes, it's probably a richer, more milder style of a, of a blend, but the flavor profile uh, is amazing. And uh, uh, I'm sorry to add that factor to it, but uh, uh, the price point, the white wine being a higher price point, makes it more interesting for the restaurant industry because you're going to have a little higher markup. You're going to have a little more uh, a possibility to, to uh, with something that is not yet known by the consumer, approach with a wine that is, that is of interest on the flavor profile that can match the, the gastronomy easily. And on top of it, you're, you're, you're making money. The, the, the story is, uh, w w when I started, I had a lovely Viognier from le, the village of Saint-Gervais uh, from the Domaine Saint Anne uh, uh, in the 80s, and I was asking my friend that worked in Monaco, uh, why, you, well, why don't you have this wine on your menu? I mean, it's lovely with with uh, all of these vegetables from Mediterranean, with this fish from from uh, from uh, from the, the area, and he said that not uh, not enough expensive. <laughs> we, hmm. <laughs> that too, yeah. that, 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 that well, too affordable. That's that's very. That's the kind of thing we like to hear. So we'll we'll definitely hang on to that. And it's true, I can support very much what you say about. The sort of the gastronomic uh, subtlety of these wines, they do work terrifically well with food. They don't have the same kind of bells and whistles and handles that some other white wines have, but they're all the better for that in the mealtime context. And I guess we should also say that, you know, with the increasing popularity of Mediterranean style food in general, uh, these wines have uh, a bigger and bigger place, I think, at, at mealtimes. I hope you enjoyed that. Like I said, there's a link to the entire episode in the show notes where I put all the goodies. Uh, you also see Christophe quoted on the fabulously educational, please go here first if you love Rhone wines, Von Rhone website. 
As for me, you can always reach out to me via email. Email me at val at glassandsession.com or on the socials. I'm on threads, Vina with Val, same as Instagram. You'll see Glass and Session in my bio as there is only one Glass and Session that is trademarked and it is mine. Glass and Session is on post. Post.news at Glass and Session. Spoutable Glass and Session. Mastodon Glass and Session at epicure.social. I'm Vina with Val on Pinterest and on Facebook slash Glass and Session, which is also my business page. I still have the Wine Gal Unbox Twitter account at Wine Gal Unbox, Blue Sky at Glass and Session dot BSKY dot social. There is Glass and Session and yes, Podcat swag in my T Public store linked way at the bottom of the show notes and on my website, including the new hashtag Cork Door Delicious Teas, Mugs, and Other Goodies. Since I don't do sponsors, read underwear ads, or do Patreon, it is a small way to fund the hosting and syndication of this wine cast. My podcast, Smoker Doodles, and I thank you so much for your support. Glass and Session is a production and registered trademark of Vino with Val, LLC. Music is Write Your Story by Joystock. Website is glassandsession.com. 